Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. To all viewers who are watching this video, thank you for being here and thank you for this great opportunity given to me today. First of all, thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious and the most merciful because of His bless and grace. This video for the final assignments on this course analysis course can be finished on time. Alhamdulillah. Salawat and salam we also send to our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who has brought us from the darkness era into the lightness era like today. I also would like to express my deepest gratitude to Sir Dr. Andi Kaharuddin, SDP, and whom as the lecturer on this course analysis course for all his guidance and support to complete this final assignment. So everyone, let me introduce myself. My name is Andi Senab Sakia. I'm the fifth semester student of English and Literature Department from Adam and Humanity Faculty, AD3, UN Alauddin Makassar, batch 2019. So the purpose of making this video is a requirement to uh, fulfill the final test assignment for a discourse analysis course. And it also to gain a better understanding about discourse analysis. So in this video, everyone, uh, we're going to discuss several topics related to discourse analysis, which has been divided into uh, 10 questions, uh, questions A and questions uh, until questions uh, G, uh, like you, you all can see right here. Okay, everyone, uh, so without any further ado, let's us discuss these questions from questions A until questions G. Well, everyone, when we started to learn something new, whether it's new skills or new materials that we get from our college or anywhere, uh, it is very important to get to know the definitions of the material in the course that we are, that we are learning. Uh, so that in this course analysis, uh, by having said that, by understanding the definitions of this course analysis, it can be at least a stepping stone uh, for us in learning and understanding it. So everyone, the word uh, this course uh, derives from a uh, Greek word, uh, which is discursus, means conversations or speech. Uh, as found in Cambridge Online Dictionary, the term discourse refers to as a communications in speech and writing. Uh, meanwhile, discourse analysis, or also known as discourse study, is the study uh, of the way a language is used between uh, between people, uh, whether in uh, both I mean both in uh, written context and uh, spoken context. So when when we are talking about discourse analysis, we are not going, we are not only going to learn about a language form, but we are also going to learn uh, a language functions, the way it is used by its native uh, speakers uh, in their social lives. That's why, uh, according to Deborah Tennant in 2014, she argues that uh, discourse analysis or, st or discourse study is sometimes called the analysis of language beyond sentence because in discourse analysis we are not only going to study about uh, linguistic features, uh, grammar, uh, clause and sentences but it's but the feel of it, the feel of discourse analysis is broader and more complex than it. Okay, everyone, let's start our discussions by answering the first questions, which is question questions A. So here's the questions A. What is the position of discourse analysis in the theory of linguistics? Um, well, as per its historical record, uh, discourse analysis or discourse studies has been linked with uh, various disciplines of studies, uh, both in humanities and social sciences, including linguistics. So. Uh, it's uh, better to know the development of the theory of linguistics first, uh, the theory of linguistics first, so that we can uh, uh, get its link to the positions of discourse analysis 
in the theory of linguistics. So as of today, uh, it is broadly known that the theory of linguistics uh, uh, has been separated into three different stages of development. Uh, uh, first is what we call traditional grammar theory. And the third is functionality. All right, everyone. So here's I'm going to explain uh, this series one by one, and let's start it uh, with. Uh, the traditional grammar. So the development of traditional grammar uh, uh, can be traced back over several centuries ago, around 18th and 19th centuries, and it was developed in uh, Europe, especially in Greek and Rome. So the term traditional grammar itself can also be reversed, uh, reversed as a school grammar. So according to uh, according to Smith in 2003, uh, traditional grammar is the study of the sentence structures as well as the formations of words, or in linguistics, we call it morphology and sentence or syntax, uh, usually without a many reference to its meaning and sounds. So basically here everyone, traditional grammar uh, focus on analyzing a language form without giving any spotlight to its uh, meaning and uh, functions. So this is one of the main shortcomings of traditional grammar, despite of its uh, prescript, prescriptive uh, rules and fairly strategic uh, grammar rules that should be followed. I'm gonna write here this focus <coughs> on. <coughs> Okay, so this uh, mention coming of the traditional uh, gra uh, grammar has been uh, the dissatisfactions of the linguists. Therefore, it uh, later prompted the, the inventions of the next theory, which is called a structuralism theory. So the development of structuralism theory is closely related to Ferdinand de Saussure. So Ferdinand de Saussure was a prominent uh, Swiss linguist uh, who also considered as the father of modern linguistics or and the father of structuralism. So he uh, he discovered the theory of structural linguistics in his book entitled um, General Linguistic, which published in 1916 in French and was written originally in French. So, uh, in the book Discourse uh, Analysis for English Language Teachings, Saussure views about the structures of language that a language was formed by a science. So, uh, a science uh, that science which finally produce speech or utterance. So a sign itself consists of two components, uh, namely signified and signifier. So in other words, uh, we know that a sign is a combination between uh, signified and signifier to gain its meaning. So the main principle of structuralism theory itself is its focus or it's 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 it it's focus on the spoken on the spoken language. So it placed the spoken language in the first place. I mean, well, the written uh, the written language uh, is placed in the second in the second in the second place. Uh, uh, further. Uh, through structuralism theory, uh, the students or learners of language uh, are also required to imitate and uh, learn a chosen language, which is called RP or receive uh, pronunciations, where it consequently uh, the teachers also required to um, 
prevent their student from making errors. I'm gonna write here, so to rouse them, is focus on spoken language. And the next uh, theory of linguistics is functionalism. So functionalism was started to develop in the beginning of 1970s. Uh, it was and it was proposed by uh, an American linguist, uh, Noam Chomsky, as his reaction to the structuralism theory. So in linguistics, uh, functionalism theory is also known as the approach of the language study that it's considered uh, that is that is considered the functions performed by by a language, primarily uh, primarily um, in in the terms of uh, cognitions, uh, cognitions, uh, expressions, and also uh, connotations. So, its main principle of the functionalism theory is its focus. Uh, it's focused to learn the functionality of a language and its elements to be the key to understand the language, uh, the linguistics process and its structures. So it's focused on language functions and its elements. Okay, everyone. So, therefore, uh, in Kahardin, in his book entitled Discourse Analysis for English Language Teaching, stated that uh, this uh, theory of linguistics, this three theory of linguistics, starting from traditionally but more structural systems and functional systems, mutually support each other uh, by giving the opportunity uh, for the emergence of discourse analysis as a theory. So, that is the positions of discourse analysis in the theory of linguistics. Well, everyone, let's move to the next questions, which is questions B. So here is the questions B. And uh, the questions B ask us to uh, found differences between discourse analysis and error analysis in terms of their linguistics, uh, background theory, and continental analysis. So here we're going to find the differences between discourse analysis and uh, error analysis. So as I've explained everyone before in the beginning of this video that discourse analysis means uh, these studies about uh, about the way in which a language is used uh, between uh, between people both in a spoken or written context. And in discourse analysis, we are not only study about uh, we not only study about uh, language form, but also its functions, and it's used in a social context as the way its native speaker, speaker uses it in their social lives. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the terms errors, errors itself, uh, according to Norris in 1987, uh, is a is a systematic deviations when uh, learners has learned something but consistently gets its wrongs. I um, mean, well, according to David Crystal, still, still the same in the 1987, uh, he argues that uh, error analysis is a technique uh, in, in identifying, uh, classifying, and systematically interpreting the uh, uh, and systematically uh, interpreting the unacceptable form uh, produced by learners or, or students who are uh, learning a foreign language using uh, principles and procedures provided by linguistics. So basically here, here everyone, uh, discourse analysis is focused on learning two 
components of language, namely form and functions, both in spoken and in written. Meanwhile, error analysis is focused on documenting uh, the errors, the errors, documenting the errors that that, that made by uh, the students and explained uh, what caused them. Well, everyone, so the next question is about the uh, terms that usually uh, appears and used in discourse analysis. Well, when we study a new materials, uh, we oftenly uh, we oftenly uh, be faced by uh, several uh, new terms or specific terms related to the material that we are learning, and it is better for us to get to know the definitions of the terms that usually use in discourse analysis. So here there are several terms. There's actually there are uh, six terms. Uh, discourse analysis, exchange, move, communicative competence, language form and language functions, and also discourse patterns. So let us define the first term, uh, which is discourse analysis. So discourse analysis or uh, discourse uh, study refers to the study to the studies about uh, about the way uh, a language uh, is used between uh, people both in spoken and uh, written context. So in discourse analysis or discourse studies, we're not only going to learn about language forms, which includes uh, language form, but we also going to learn about uh, language uh, functions as well. So discourse analysis is also called the analysis of language beyond sentence because uh, in discourse analysis we are not gonna analyze we're not gonna analyze the uh, the linguistic features of a language uh, grammar uh, voc uh, vocabulary uh, clause and sentence but discourse analysis field is broader and more complex than that so that's why it's called uh, the analysis of language beyond sentence because we are also uh, learns its meaning its functions as well as uh, cultural factors of different uh, writing texts and any types of talks and uh, well everyone let's move to the second terms which is ex exchange so in general terms exchange can be defined as the uh, as as an as an act as an act of uh, of of giving something or receiving another or something, but in discourse analysis, the terms exchange can be defined as a sequence of discourse moves by at least uh, two speakers uh, that form uh, that form uh, a topical or subtopical units. Uh, okay, everyone. So the unit that has been formed according to Sinclair and Coulthard is then called exchange, where an exchange uh, in discourse analysis consists of three elements, which are initiations, symbolizes with I, uh, response, symbolizes with R, and uh, then F, symbol feedback, symbolizes uh, symbolizes uh, as F. Uh, next is the term moves. So uh, each part, each part of exchange is still from uh, Sinclair and Coulthard. They argue that each part of exchange is called moves. So in in every exchange, there is uh, several moves uh, started from the first move which is functions as a questions the second move which is functions as a, a response and the third move which is functions as a comment uh, next is communicative competence so the definition of communicative competence in linguistics refers to the ability of a person or a students or a students to communicate or to functions a language in a communicative settings, or in other words, uh, to use grammatical a grammat to use grammatical sentence in a language, or 
in the appropriate uh, context at the right time and uh, the right place. So basically, uh, here everyone, the communicative uh, competence, uh, communicative competence consists of two competence, which are uh, grammatical competence and also uh, cultural uh, competence. Next, we move to the terms language form and language uh, functions. Language uh, forms deal with the internal grammar structures of words uh, and phrases, as well as the as well as the formation of the words itself, themselves. And, um, meanwhile, uh, like uh, it's including linguistic features and also grammar and vocabulary. Uh, in a way, language functions reverse uh, in what students uh, use a language uh, as they engage with consent and interact to each other. So the the term functions here reverse reverse. Uh, uh, I mean, like I mean, uh, the term functions here uh, represent the uh, the use of the use of uh, uh, language. So the use of language in a specific in a specific in, in a specific uh, in a specific purpose. And the last one is uh, discourse uh, patterns. So discourse patterns can be defined as the arrangements, is the lo as the logical arrangements of the idea of expositionary uh, writing text or of an orally uh, uh, presentations, uh, presentations. And uh, both uh, spoken and written discourse have their own patterns. For example, uh, spoken discourse, there is a pattern IRF, initiations, response, and feedback, uh, which found in, in the uh, speaking as transactionals or, uh, or conversations. Usually, uh, we could find that patterns in the classroom conversations and casual conversations. Meanwhile, in uh, written in written discourse, in in writing discourse, uh, there are several. There are also uh, several patterns, uh, which are cohesive and coherence devices, uh, sentence patterns, and also text patterns. Okay, everyone. Let's move to the four questions of our discussions today. So here are the questions, which are about the scopes of spoken discourse in discourse analysis. Well, discourse is a unit of uh, is a unit of a language uh, above uh, sentence levels, which is used to communicate in a social in a social life or in a social context. So, uh, discourse itself can be separated into two different types, namely spoken discourse and written discourse. Spoken discourse refers to uh, a type of discourse that is realized orally. Meanwhile. Uh, uh, written discourse refers to a type of discourse that is uh, realized in, uh, in in writing. So here, talking about spoken discourse, uh, there are there are several types of it, uh, namely. So I'm gonna write this. Spoken. This course. There are three types of spoken discourse, namely uh, speaking as interaction, speaking as transaction, and the last one is speaking as performance. Speaking as transactions is a type of spoken discourse, is a type of spoken discourse 
discord that is uh, usually found in our real social lives in terms of uh, in terms of interpersonal uh, conversations or or dialect. Uh, speaking as interaction itself can be divided into two types, namely classroom conversation and casual conversation. Classroom conversation itself refers to uh, a conversation or a dialogue that happens in the in the classroom, usually between teachers and their students during a learning and teaching process. You know, well, casual conversation refers to a day-to-day -day, uh, dialogue or conversation that it usually happens in our daily life. Uh, casual conversations uh, uh, usually performed by at least two people who are talking about a, a specific topic or a particular topic that later created that later created uh, uh, that later created a sequence of of, of discourse. Uh, next is uh, speaking as transactions. Speaking as, as transaction, according to Carudin in 2018, is um, is aimed to is aimed to 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 describe to describe the uh, to describe the functions of the spoken language uh, to this broken language uh, for for transacting messages or or informations in social in social life that's why it's called uh, transactions so speaking as transaction itself including uh, discussion and debate. debate well we move to the last ones of the spoken discourse which is speaking as performers. Speaking as performers, according to Richard in 2008, uh, he stated that speaking as a performance or performance of speaking is a type of spoken discourse that is aimed uh, at transmitting messages or information in front of an audience, uh, in front of an, or on the audience, uh, and uh, it's usually uh, in a form of a monologue uh, monologue rather than uh, rather than a, a dialogue a dialogue which uh, usually its speaker uh, often use uh, formality formality in which is uh, close in, in which it's uh, closer to a written language rather than to interpersonal language uh, spoken spoken language so uh, this speaking as information can be divided into two types namely um, a speech and presentation. Okay, everyone. So uh, next, we're gonna move to the fifth questions of our discussion for today's sessions. So right here, as you can see, there is a dialogue uh, between two people. Uh, between two people, so in the form of a casual dialect, uh, the dialect between James and his uh, friends, probably man, uh, who asked for her apologize about something terrible that he has been said last night to, to her. So here's the dialect. James, I really want to apologize to you. What for? I'm really sorry about what I said to you the other night. Oh, forget it. I can't. It was terrible to say. Okay, okay. Enough is enough. I accept your apologies. So here, everyone, we're going to analyze this uh, casual conversations, this dialogue, uh, to find its uh, discourse sequence, uh, its move, uh, functions, as well as its internal internal structures of this dialogue. So, uh, the. But before that, I would like to mention the aim of studying the casual conversations, especially in language pedagogy, is to get to know how casual conversations work in a casual situation and how it is used in the social lives. Uh, uh, actually, in 1985, Coulthard uh, did an analysis on casual conversations like this, and he found that there is a similar uh, pattern that that is that is also used in the classroom conversations, but also found 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 in the in the casual conversations. But it has a little bit difference uh, between uh, them them as well. So the pattern that Cole had found in his analysis on casual conversations is.
So here is the pattern that killed her phone on his analysis on casual conversations. And we are going to analyze this uh, uh, dialogue to find its discourse sequence, uh, moves, function, as well as internal structure. But before that, I would like to uh, uh, tell you that uh, we're going to use a, 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 a science a slash, this slash right here, to mark every, every, every uh, discourse sequence uh, that has that we have in this data so that we it can make us easier to analyze and to identify its sequence it and also its internal structure so i'm gonna mark every uh, sequence with a slash three four five six so here's there are six there are six, uh, six sequences in this dialect. Okay, let's start it by analyzing the first, uh, the first dialect that has been uttered by the first uh, speaker right here. James, I really want to apologize to you. In this score analysis, it, uh, on, spoken, on spoken discourse, it is categorized as initiation. So it's labeled as I where it functions as a statement. So it's also used as a uh, function at its first move. Okay, everyone. So later, this statement is the respondent uh, by the speaker's interlocutors with James by answering or by asking, what for? So here's the right response. But everyone, according to Cold Heart, this kind of this kind of uh, uh, response is not really a response because it's not it rep really represents the uh, answer of uh, the answer of the statement of or the initiations in the previous uh, sentence. So that's uh, therefore uh, we write here response slash i, which means that uh, this is in this response. Uh, contains of the second initiations. So here is the functions, the questions. And then uh, this questions elicit the second, the second, the second or slash I, the second response and the third initiations, the third uh, in the chasens, which also functions as a statement. And then it's later again elicits uh, other uh, response and the fourth initiations, which is functions as a command. And responding to the previous statements uttered by the first speakers, and then uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, command later uh, be responded by the the next speakers by saying, "I can't. It was terrible to say." So it functions uh, as a rejection as a rejection to the comment that had been said. Here we will gonna write it or in the form of rejections. And, and finally, everyone, this response in the form of rejections uh, finally uh, uh, elicit a utterance from the speaker's interlocutors uh, by saying, okay, okay, enough is enough. I have your apologies, which is called follow up. Or we could symbolize it as F in the form of uh, responding, uh, responding the uh, the rejection, or in the form of confirmations to function to respond uh, the the previous rejection. Confirmation. So we found that 
from this analysis, the paths in use for this dialect is I or I or I or I or F. In one its installment structures, we can see that from the slash we have made that we found that its installment structure from this dialect is M W M W M so here is the answers for the questions uh, A. Well, everyone, let's move to the next questions. Uh, here is, is the questions uh, which asks about uh, another the definitions of the of these uh, terms uh, in discourse analysis, uh, especially in a writing discourse. So as you can see here, there is the terms micro and macro analysis, cohesion and coherence, grammatical cohesive devices, and lexical cohesions. So micro analysis uh, deals with the uh, linguistics uh, elements. Deal with deal with linguistics elements of of a text, such as uh, verb, uh, uh, prepositions, uh, pronouns, sentences, etc. So it focus it focus on it focus on uh, vocabulary and grammar, grammar including uh, cohesive uh, relations and as well as uh, grammatical uh, grammatical uh, regu regulations uh, of a text. Uh, next is macroanalysis. Meanwhile, macroanalysis. Uh, Macroanalysis, uh, according to Fundix frameworks in 1980, uh, refers to as a global uh, a global meaning of a text. So uh, macroanalysis uh, macroanalysis indicates the theme and the topic of a text. Next term is cohesion and coherence. Uh, according to Carvin in 2018, coherence uh, coherence uh, refers to the way. Uh, to the way the to the way a text uh, a text is is tied together by linguistic devices such as vocabulary uh, and grammar to set up well constructed uh, relations uh, relations uh, of meaning within 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 a text. So uh, 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 meanwhile, a coherence a text it's uh, it's said to to have a coherence if it's uh, constituent sentences uh, are constructed uh, in an orderly uh, fashion so that uh, the readers uh, can make a sense of entire text. Uh, therefore, it is said that uh, if a text has a high uh, a high uh, cohesion, uh, then it will determine a text uh, coherence uh, coherence for 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 a reader. Uh, next term is uh, grammatical cohesive devices. So grammatical cohesive devices uh, can be defined as uh, devices used to create a coherence uh, in a text. So in uh, writing discourse, uh, grammatical cohesive devices itself uh, can be separated into four types, uh, namely a reference, a substitution, ellipsis, and the last one is conjunctions. Next terms, or the last terms, that were is uh, lexical uh, cohesions. So, lexical uh, cohesions uh, it's, uh, itself refers to vocab vocabulary used to to make a coherence in a text. Uh, in writing discourse, a lexical uh, cohesions can be separated into two different types, namely reiterations and also a collocation. Okay, everyone, so let's move to the next questions, which is question is key, and uh, it asks about how to analyze text patterns in discourse analysis. Well, uh, according to Hui in 2001, uh, there are three major types of text patterns that usually use in writing in writing in English, in writing a text in English. Those pat patterns are patterns are first school 
problem solution pattern second is called general choose specific pattern and the last one is claim counter claim pattern so problem solutions uh, uh, patterns is, uh, according to Fui is the most uh, common type of text patterns uh, found in found uh, in the text in English uh, whether in uh, fairy tales or scientific uh, writings according to Hui, problem solution patterns has four uh, elements which are situation problem um, reason and evaluations so each of these text patterns also uh, has its own uh, elements let's move to the general specific patterns so general specific patterns also called as the uh, uh, deductive organization organization of uh, organizations uh, uh, patterns uh, which which refer to the way uh, the way a writer the way a uh, writer developing a text by moving from a, a a broad information to the more specific information that supports the topic uh, of of a text so general specific patterns according to mccarthy uh, also has several elements which are general specific more specific and it get back to general the last one is claim counterclaim pattern so claim counterclaim claim uh, uh, patterns is a type of uh, text patterns uh, which refers to the structures of ideas in which a claim or a statement about something and the counterclaim, the opposite of this, the opposite statement of of a claim, uh, 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 presented presented in relations presented in relations to give to give issue in a text. So according to Kimberley in 2016, claim counterclaim patterns consist of four elements, which are Claim, counterclaim, reason, and evidence. Okay, everyone. So right here, I'm going to explain uh, how we analyze uh, text patterns in this course analysis. So as you can see here, there is a sentence which consists of there is a text which consists of, of four sentences. Uh, uh, we are going to analyze this uh, text by by found the what kind of element that it's 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 sentence uh, use. Uh, in developing, in developing these uh, these texts. So as you can see here, everyone, in the first sentence, most people like to take a camera with them when they travel abroad. This sentence, this sentence is called situations, which reverse which which refers to a specific uh, conditions or events. Uh, Next is the second sentence. But all airports nowadays have extra security screenings 
and x-rays can damage films. This sentence is called a problem uh, that occurs due to these situations. And the third sentence, one solution to this problem is to purchase lead line pouch. Is called a reasons which over a solution to the problem given. And the fourth and the last sentence here is these are cheap and can protect them from from all but the strongest X-ray. Well, the strongest X-ray. It's called evaluations, which aim to evaluate uh, the solutions or the reason given in the previous uh, sentence, whether the reason is uh, positive or negative. So, so everyone, we know that uh, this uh, text using uh, problem solution pattern which consists of four elements namely situation we symbolize this as, as problem we symbolize this as P and then reason like this SR and evaluations. So that is as E. These elements of problem solution patterns also carry its own functions. Situations is aimed to give uh, background information of the text. A problem uh, is to raise a particular problem uh, that occurs due to the situations. Reason, reasons is uh, to give, uh, um, it usually contains a solutions which related to the uh, problem and evaluations is uh, usually deals with uh, whether the problem of uh, the tax uh, is positive or, or negative. So it's to evaluate the the solution which over from the problem. Okay, everyone, let's move to the next questions, the eight questions for our discussions today. So right here, I'm going to explain about how to analyze uh, sentence patterns in uh, discourse analysis. So a text uh, consists of several sentences. Uh, where each sentence uh, can be split to several uh, components. Those uh, components uh, consist of a, a team and a ring. So team here refers to the uh, already known informations, meanwhile the ring refers to uh, new information. So for example, there is a sentence like Jakarta is the capital city of Indonesia. Jakarta here, the word Jakarta here is, is the theme of this sentence. Despite being it's the subject of this sentence, it's also become the topic of the talk of this sentence, which later described or followed by a rim, which is the clause of the capital city of Indonesia. So the capital city of Indonesia, it could be a new information. Uh, Jakarta is the capital. The capital city of Indonesia, it could be the uh, uh, new information for some people. That's why it's called a rim, because it's also explained the topic of the sentence, which is Jakarta. Okay, everyone, so in this course analysis itself, uh, uh, sentence patterns in English um, usually used in writing, in writing discourse, uh, can be separated into uh, seven types, namely first, Sentence patterns is called simple linear progression. So, in simple linear progression starts it with a uh, the first sentence of simple linear uh, progression sentence is uh, usually started with a team and it's later followed by a rim, where a unit of rim in the first clause uh, is later become 
the the theme of the uh, of the following of the following uh, sentence. It's also called the weather. That's that's why it's also called a zigzag uh, progressions. Uh, second is called constant. Progressions. So in constant progressions, everyone, the team, the unit, an item in the team of the first clause also become the second team for the following clause. Next is called multiple rim. Progression. So in multiple rim progressions, it all it's the first sentence also consists of a theme and later explained by a rim, where a rim uh, usually uh, consists of several uh, uh, components, usually two or three components. That's why it's called multiple. And the fourth is called splitting. Splitting progression. Splitting progressions, the sentence is also started uh, with the rim and it's you and it, with the theme and it's later is explained by a rim where a rim of uh, the clause uh, usually consists of several unspecified uh, components. Okay, next is linear. Constant progression. In linear constant progressions, a sentence also consists of a rim and a team, where a unit of a rim in the first clause becomes a team in the second clause, but uh, and it's later explained by the second rim and so on. And next is constant linear. Progression. Progression. Constant linear progressions. Uh, its first sentence also consists or developed by a rim and a team, where the team in the in the first clause we also become the team in the second in the second in the second uh, sentence. Uh, but when writers write the third sentence, uh, he takes. Uh, a unit of a rim in the second in the second in the second sentence to be to be the uh, team in his third sentence. Next is elliptical. elliptical. So elliptical progression, everyone, refers to the use of the elliptic elements by using uh, two two-ended arrows. Uh, which used to uh, find the uh, the elliptic uh, the elliptic connecting relationship between the first teams used in the sentence in the first sentence and 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 the second ones. Okay, everyone. So right here, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain uh, to you all how to uh, analyze sentence patterns in the text. So right here, as you can see, there is a text which consists of three sentences. Uh, each sentence is, uh, carries uh, its own team and also rim. So let's take a look to the sentence pattern that it's used to develop uh, to develop this text. So here's in the first sentence, the diverse battle has already begun for Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. The the diverse battles here is the first team of the uh, first sentence. And while the following clause that explain these teams has already been for Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie is called the first rim, or we could symbolize this as R1. Later, the unit of uh, rim in the first sentence, rim 1, is used 
as the theme for the second sentence. The 41-year-old actress, the 41-year-old artist here refers to Angelina Jolie, which is one of the unit of the rim in sentence one. And next, it is followed by the second rim, has reportedly added two more top-notch lawyers to her teams. This is called rim two, or rim for the second sentence. And then, again, the unit of the rims in uh, sentence two, the second sentence, is later becomes the theme for the third sentence. That's units are lawyers, top-notch lawyers, which refers to Laura Wessers, which becomes the third team of the third sentence. Next, it's a letter be explained by the third rim of the third sentence, which is a celebrity lawyers is joining to fight Brad 54 everything she wants from their speech. So Laura Wester's is a celebrity did for divorce lawyers. So everyone, from this analysis, we found that this uh, uh, text using uh, uh, te text patterns, simple linear linear progressions. Which can be written like this T1, whereas Rim 1 becomes the second theme of the second sentence, which followed by the second Rim, and then Rim 2 becomes the third theme of the third sentence, which later followed by rim three. So that's why simple linear progressions is also called Caesar progressions. Well everyone, let's move to the next questions. Here's the questions. What factors to consider in selecting targeted discourse to be analyzed? Uh, so uh, there are actually several factors that should be considered uh, uh, in selecting targeted discourse, either in spoken or writing discourse, especially in the purpose of teachings. Those factors, uh, namely, the So the first is called the suitability of the materials to a learner's needs. So learner's needs here refers to what learners want to learn and hope to achieve. So if the materials, if the materials of learning is appropriate to the learner's needs, uh, it can be uh, easier to grab their attention so that uh, the objective of the learnings can be easier to achieve. The second considerations is called the authenticity of the selected material. So, uh, talking about the selected material that we can use and uh, learning discourse analysis, there are actually so many authentic materials that surround us in our daily lives, such as newspapers, magazines, TV series, films, uh, advertisements, uh, etc. So by learning the authentic materials, discourse analysis uh, can help student, it can help to shape the student's uh, language uh, look 
and to help them to sound more naturally so that the students can use a language uh, more effectively and uh, to help them to sound more naturally like the way the native speakers use it in their digital life. Uh, well, everyone, let's, let's move to the last questions for our, our uh, discussions today. So uh, the questions is also about the significant contributions and uh, English language of discourse analysis in English language dictionary. So uh, this is us for personal opinions. So after I learned discourse analysis so far, I'm going to answer it by saying yes, of course. Uh, it, uh, uh, this course analysis has a very significant uh, contribution in English language pedagogy, as we know that this course is not only focused on a learning language form, but also expansions, uh, expansion, expansion as well as the cultural factors uh, from uh, different writing texts and uh, and types of talks, uh, where uh, the contributions of uh, this course analysis in English language pedagogy. Uh, it can be seen from the applications of discourse analysis on language pedagogy itself. So discourse analysis, uh, discourse analysis uh, can be applied in uh, language uh, English uh, language pedagogy into two uh, methods. First method, two I mean two models, two models of teaching, uh, nam namely. Uh, to teach the application of discourse analysis to teaching grammar, teaching grammar. So the application of uh, discourse analysis to teaching uh, the first contributions of uh, discourse analysis is English language teach English language uh, teaching and learning. It can be used uh, to teach uh, grammar. So by studying discourse analysis uh, in teaching grammar, uh, teachers uh, uh, are also required not only to uh, teach students uh, the rules of grammar and how to uh, how to form a sentence, a specific a sentence, but uh, they also uh, are required uh, required to uh, explain the, the characteristics of uh, the discourse characteristics in those in those. Uh, in those uh, grammar rules and the purpose of uh, of the and and the functions of the form, so that the students uh, can can have uh, can able to use the grammatical uh, the grammatical uh, rules to communicate. Next is called the applications of discourse analysis to. Teaching vocabulary. Vocabulary. So as we know, everyone, that vocabulary is one of the important things that uh, determine the students' proficiency, proficiency in uh, in learning a language. So the more vocabulary uh, someone has, uh, the better English uh, he gets. So by studying uh, discourse analysis, it it is hoped that it can. Uh, enrich a student's uh, vocabulary. Well, everyone, we finally at the end of this uh, video, and we are uh, and we already have answers all the questions from questions A until questions uh, G. Uh, contains of ten different questions uh, about discourse analysis. However, it is very uh, essential to review a little, a little, or some material that we have. Uh, that we have uh, learned, uh, that we have uh, learned. So, uh, discourse analysis uh, or discourse uh, study is the study uh, about the way a language uh, is used between uh, peoples, both in written or spoken context. So, uh, it also requires a cultural uh, different cultural dif cultural factors. Of different uh, different writing texts and as as well as uh, any types of uh, talks. So that's why it's also called discourse analysis is also called uh, 
uh, an analysis of uh, language beyond the sentence because it studies not only about form of language but also uh, its functions. So the way the language is used uh, in social in social in social contexts. So in book discourse analysis for the English language uh, teachings, there are three main reasons. Uh, in studying a uh, discourse analysis, which can really benefit us, especially for learners who are learning a foreign language. The first reason is called academic reasons. The second reason is called pragmatical reasons. And the third reason is called uh, pedagogical uh, reasons. So everyone, uh, by studying uh, uh, discourse uh, analysis, it is uh, hope that that uh, students or learners of language can gain what we call a communicative competence. Therefore, I would like to recommend for every language teachers or language students or learners who are now learning, a f especially English of foreign language, uh, it should uh, be better uh, to uh, start to study uh, discourse analysis because it's uh, it uh, consists of uh, the study of language form as well as the language function so that we can gain a communicative competence, a communicative competence which consists of two main competences that a learner should, ha uh, should have uh, in learning a language, namely a grammatical competence as well as the uh, cultural uh, competence. Well, uh, before I end this video, I would like to uh, thank to, I would like to give my, uh, send my thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for his uh, blessing grace. Uh, finally, I could finish this uh, video and hand in on time. And I also would like to uh, thank my parents who worked tirelessly to provide everything that I need and I want, especially for my uh, study. I would like, I also would like to thank my uh, Sis uh, siblings, uh, my s little sisters and little brothers, who could be sometimes, sometimes annoying, but I still love them, of course. And I would like to sa send my thanks to uh, my my uh, college friends, uh, college friends. Uh, thanks for uh, every kind words. Uh, thanks for up and downs during these uh, semesters, during these semesters. And I hope uh, that this pandemic will. Uh, will end very soon and we could uh, meet uh, again and uh, study in our classroom at uh, our uh, our university. Uh, I also would like to thank and send my deepest gratitude to uh, Sir Dr. Mikarudin as the lecturer as the lecturer on discourse analysis course for all his support and guidance during this uh, discourse. Uh, uh, this discourse and uh, thanks and also thanks for the uh, and also thanks for the uh, books. So this book helps me a lot. I took many so many references from it and I learned so many lessons from it. Um, okay, uh, I would like. To, I also would like to thank you, everyone, who are watching this video, especially uh, for you all who watch this video until the end. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you uh, next time.